We'll, we'll start in a little under one minute. I'd just like to request before we start that everyone silence their phones and pagers to, uh, out of respect for our speaker. And we will start at precisely 6.30, so welcome everyone. Waiting just a few seconds. Good evening. Welcome to the Robert H. Rewalt and Susan M. Rewalt lecture sponsored by the Mayo Clinic Dolores Jean Lavin Center for Humanities and Medicine. I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining us remotely watching this event live from your home computers or other locations. My name is Paul Scanlon. I'm the medical director of the Lavin Center for Humanities and Medicine. The center supports the primary value of Mayo Clinic, the needs of the patient come first, by integrating the arts and other expressions of human culture into the healing environment of Mayo Clinic. Today we're honored to welcome Gerd Landhart, who is internationally recognized for his expertise in technological advances as our presenter for the 2017 Rewalt Lecture. Some of you may recall our previous Rewalt lecture at Mayo Clinic in 2014 featuring Dr. James Orbinski, humanitarian and global health advocate, who served as international president for Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, or MSF, also known as Doctors Without Borders, from 1998 to 2001. In 1999, Doctors Without Borders was awarded the Nobel Prize in, uh, no, sorry, the Nobel Peace Prize, and he received it on their behalf. Support for this lecture is pr provided by our generous benefactors, Robert and Su Susan Rewalt. We're deeply grateful for their gift. The Rewalts are residents of Oregon and Iowa and longtime Mayo Clinic patients. Mr. Rewalt credits Mayo Clinic with saving his life and his mother's life many times over. The endowed fund that makes this lecture series possible is given in honor of Mr. Rewalt's parents, Martha and Fred Rewalt. Mr. and Mrs. Rewalt regret that they are unable to join us here in person to, uh, this evening, but it is our understanding that they have joined us online, and uh, to that we say thanks and welcome to the Rewalds. Um, the Rewalds are passionate in their advocacy for peace, health, and in particular, engaging citizenry through direct democracy as practiced in, by the Swiss form of government. Mr. Lanhardt is a Swiss futurist, visionary thinker, keynote speaker, and author who is listed by Wired Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people in Europe in 2015. Gerd Lanhardt's work focuses on the future of humanity and technology, digital transformation, big data, automation, artificial intelligence and robotics, media, content, marketing and advertising, telecommunications, culture and tourism, banking and financial services, and government and leadership. Uh, his most recent book, Technology Versus Humanity, was published in 2016 by Fast Future Publishing and it poses the question, how can humanness prevail in the face of environmental and all-encompassing technological change? Gerd is uh, considered a leading voice on the wide range of topics, including digital transformation and discovery of digitally native business models. Gerd is a fellow in the Royal Society for the Arts of London and a member of the World Future Society. He's a native of Germany. Uh, he currently resides in Zurich, Switzerland, and maintains an office in San Francisco. Tonight, he will speak on the topic of the future of technology and its impact on direct democracy. Following the lecture, Mr. Landhard will take questions. Please raise your hand and our staff members will bring the microphone. We'd like to get every, uh, all the questions on uh, the broadcast. Uh, also, we'd like to invite you to use for social media, use the hashtag, uh, hashtag Mayo Humanities, if you'd like to share anything from this lecture on social media. For those who use Twitter, Mr. Landhard's handle is uh, at G. Landhart, one word. You'll find many uh, additional of his lectures uh, on GerardTube.com. So with that, please join me in welcoming Gerard Leonhard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a great honor to be with you tonight. 
Um, also, very much a big thank you to the Rewald family for making this work. And so I have the pleasure to talk to you about the future. Uh, the future is an interesting topic. You know, the, uh, the reason I became a futurist is because I used to be a musician and producer, uh, basically in the music business. And then in the mid-90s, I got sucked onto the internet. And I started something like Spotify. Some of you may know Spotify. Uh, Ten years too early. Uh, in, the, in the process of which I lost $20 million of investment and went bankrupt. So it was a very good experience. I was ahead of the future. And um, then I wrote a book called The Future of Music. And that was my first book uh, about the music business. And that became a bestseller. And so I became uh, the go-to person if people want to find out what the future brings for their business. And in the last uh, five years, you know, I, I do about 100 speeches a year. And I do a lot of, uh, we call that basically coaching sessions for CEOs and boards and you know, people who want to think about the future. Number one question I get is, what is going to happen to people when the entire world is all about technology? Uh, today, if you're 25 years old, if you want a date, you swipe on your mobile phone. If you want a doctor, you ask Siri or Cortana on your mobile phone. If you want to ride, you go to Uber. And the world is changing so tremendously. Uh, most of it is for the good, you know, so to say that I'm actually an optimist on the future. Right? But technology will essentially allow us to, to become superhuman or in, in a technology kind of way. I mean, what we can do today with these devices makes us de facto super. Right? We can keep our addresses in here, we can listen to music, we can buy stock, uh, we can have an automatic language translation. You know, just three months ago I was in Japan, in Tokyo, in a sushi bar, I used this app called Say Hi, okay? And Say Hi allows me to speak in 34 languages. You know, simple stuff, but not bad. And then I had a half hour conversation with a sushi chef about Japan and nuclear power and fish and you know, using this app, speaking back and forth. I was speaking in German and he spoke in, in Japan, Japanese. Right? That's like Star Trek, basically. So, uh, my new book is available. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to download my slides, I probably have way too many slides, but I will, uh, I will be a little bit flexible on them. You can download later tomorrow morning at uh, futurewithgerd.com. If you're having trouble remembering my name, think about gastrointestinal reflux disease, you know, <laughs> G-E-R-D, then you have my name. Right? So I'm actually number two GERD after the disease on the internet. That's a, a dubious honor, but... So uh, my book, Technology versus Humanity, is available on Amazon, and we do have a special PDF. I think you have it on the table already on those little slips there. You can download the PDF for uh, half the price for the next week on this website. But it's, you know, it's on your table, so you can, you can see the code. But if you like print, you know, old-fashioned print, I do have two, uh, two here. I will give away the first question gets a free book, right? That should be enough motivation for you to, to engage, right? So this is really my job. You know, I don't predict the future. That's very hard to do. I, we had people like Alvin Toffler, Arthur C. Clarke, that could do that, you know, they're sort of the Jimi Hendrix of futurism. Uh, I observe, that's my job. In China they say, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. That is because our children don't have to make money, they don't have to be busy with all these uh, things that we have to do every day, they can observe. That's the number one skill to have, really. So, as I like to say to my client, it's most important the future is no longer a time frame, it's a mindset. It's no longer about tomorrow because the future is already here. I mean, if depending on where you're going, you can see the future. In Korea, you can download a, a movie in 1.4 seconds, an entire movie, yeah. two gigabyte. In Japan, people have, uh, instead of having pets, they have robots, robo-pets. Yeah. It's hard to believe. 1.5 million people have a pet that's a robot yeah, that they teach. Here in the U.S., Roughly 14 million people use uh, this uh, Amazon device called Echo. Some of you may know that, Echo Alexa, that you speak to as if it was a person. Now, in Germany, we wouldn't touch that because it's basically an open microphone. You know, we, 
and we'd be paranoid about being listened to. You know? So, but the future's already here. Self-driving cars, you know, if you ever get a chance to drive one, you wouldn't go on the German Autobahn with one. And that, that would be suicide. But, you know, it's working pretty well if you know traffic jam in Los Angeles. Now, very soon, we have the first airplanes that don't have a pilot. Right? This is mostly for freight planes, of course, right? Because we probably wouldn't go on them otherwise. But, you know, the future's already here, so it's really important to have a mindset. And really what happens here is that in this future, we're rapidly moving towards a place where technology and humanity is coming closer than ever before. Some people would say we're merging with technology. So uh, I, in the book I say that in the next 20 years we're going to have more chains, uh, change than the previous 300 years. That's because technology is now capable of doing things. You know, just five years ago, your computer was still pretty stupid. You couldn't speak to it. It couldn't program itself. It certainly wouldn't learn anything. It wasn't fast enough. It would crash. Now, in the near future, a computer will have infinite processing power, you know, quantum, what's called quantum computing. That basically means that in a, in a very short while, in our lifetime, well, I I'm include all of you here, right? But let's say five to ten years, right? In our lifetime combined, you know, we have this, this change where technology is no longer going to be outside of us, but actually inside of us. For example, through nanotherapy, robots in your bloodstream, directly connecting to the internet, brain-computer interfaces. Artificial intelligence, machines that can think, straight from science fiction. The stuff that you saw in Star Trek, you know, I know Star Trek is like, what, 50 years ago? You pull out the device and you hold it to a sick person and the device fixes the problem. We're getting there now with remote diagnosis. There's 25 devices going on the market next, uh, this year and next year that will allow the patient to have a remote diagnosis that goes into the cloud and basically says, okay, you don't have to come in, it's not serious. Yeah. Scans your rash, you prick your finger, you cough into it. And that's actually going on the market in China now called Scanadu, this device. It's $100 and allows anybody to have a diagnosis from home. Of course, that wouldn't really work when it's about depression or asthma or, you know. But if it's about minor things, you know, I could, we're getting there, right? The question I have for you, how far would you go? Would you connect directly with technology if it was easy? I mean, the fact is, with these devices here, this is our external brain. It's your second brain. I don't know how heavy of a user you are, but you know, in here, uh, I don't remember all the phone numbers of my friends. They're just in here. It's like my brain. My financial records, my health records, my movies, my music, it's all in here. And, you know, these days when you're sitting in a bar talking to other guys, you know, you, you no longer talk about cars or, or whatever. You talk about what apps you have. Right? Uh, it's kind of pathetic, actually. But <laughs> this device now is, is, is essentially becoming our second brain, and this is much more powerful, more powerful than the president of the U.S. had at his disposal 15 years ago in a mainframe computer. Now, this machine is going to have a million times the processing power in roughly 10 years. So it can take your DNA, and you can have a live analytic of your DNA that tells you what, is, what has changed as compared to the last time, just in 10 years, in real time. So a lot of changes are coming, and the question really is this, right, in the end. Sometimes I wonder, are we the last generation of unaugmented humans? I mean, we're in a way already augmented with a mobile phone, or demented, you could say. But is this the last time, you know, for example, my kids and uh, the kids of my kids, they, they will live in a world where being connected is like breathing. In many ways, we're always online, right? We're always connected. Because the internet is always there. Uh, in fact, now I have a new book I'm working on. It's called Offline is the New Luxury. It's a luxury to not be connected. So that is a huge change. And you know, clearly, as far as democracy is concerned, huh, the impact of technology on democracy is both really terrible 
and really good. That is, of course, generally what technology does. <laughs> so we're able to use Facebook to connect with friends and loved ones from 50 years ago. Uh, we can use online dating to find a partner. We can use all these amazing things. And then at the same time, turns out that the same medium, the social media, right, is killing the traditional media, right, because all the advertising money goes there. So it's kind of a mix of good and bad things. But we still have this thing called the Moravec paradox, which I think you'll be familiar with if, you're, if you have a science background, which I don't have. I'm just boring it. Right? But basically, Moravec said, this is very important, Hans Moravec was one of the leading researchers for intelligence. He said, whatever is simple for a computer, it's very hard for a person, a human, and vice versa. So when we meet in the hallway later, or having a drink or so, it takes an average of 0.4 seconds for one human to kind of identify the other. You know, to see, are you a threat? Are you interesting? That's without saying anything. 0.4 seconds. We make up our mind about the other person in 0.4 seconds. Now, a computer could observe you for 10 years, look at all of your Google searches. It would still not know that. It would know that you've always searched for sushi in Boston or whatever, those kind of things, right? But it still wouldn't know you. So ultimately, I think the concern about technology becoming too human, I think it's probably a little bit premature. You know, we've heard Elon Musk and, and um, Stephen Hawkins talk about that. There is something to it which I'll explain, but basically what we're seeing here is our biggest challenge is really this one. Huh? The biggest challenge isn't that computers and robots will come and kill us, you know, the Hollywood, you know, Ex Machina, Terminator, Blade Runner, you know, that sort of thing. They're far away from actually being anywhere close as intelligent. The biggest problem that we're having is that we're becoming too much like the machines. So we're expecting everything to be instant. We have no more patience. We're thinking that everything is an app. You know, there's an app for everything, or one way or the other. So I have, I have two kids, and one of my kids uh, years ago said, uh, when the iPad came out, he wants to be a musician, but he doesn't want to actually study the instrument. He just wants to get the iPad and, and a hundred-dollar app to play music. Right? And that's what he calls a musician. I mean, I went to Berkeley College. I studied for 10,000 hours. And I still wasn't good enough, <laughs> so I didn't really do anything. But anyway, 10,000 hours compared to 10 hours, I'm going to be a 10-hour musician. You know, It's obviously easier. That is what I call machine thinking. So we look at other people and we say, OK, in the medical field, that's just all like science and algorithms and analytics and big data. and. But the reality is that our lives really aren't data. They have a lot to do with data, but our lives are quite a bit beyond data. So I, I have several chapters in this presentation. I'll probably skip some because of the timing, but this is the uh, most important curve of the evening. You've seen it before, the exponential curve. Okay? Basically means Moore's law, Metcalfe's law. The power of technology doubles every 18 to 24 months. And when, the, when you're at the beginning of the curve, it doesn't matter because you don't see much. So 1995, we're talking about the paperless office or streaming of music. Didn't work, didn't matter. But today, we're at the pivot point, right? We're at the takeoff point where literally science fiction is becoming science fact. I mean, if you're a scientist, you probably dispute some of this. But, but basically what's happening is all the stuff that we talked about here is, is finally working. For example, you can use Gmail, Google, to send money. Right? To each other, anybody in the US can send money through Google. You can make free phone calls on Facebook. Right? WhatsApp. You're probably using WhatsApp if you have international friends. I mean, that basically, the telecom companies are losing $100 million a day because people can use that free stuff. So we're now getting to the point where basically anything is the sky is the limit. I mean, th just think about this for a second. When you're here, you're doubling 0 0.01. You have 0 0.02, 0 0.04. It's nothing, right? It doesn't matter. 
as Hemingway says, gradually, then suddenly. Right? So when you're at four, 12, 18 months from now, eight, 16, 32, you are in five years, 30 times as far. You go 30 up, X up the scale, you're in the, in, the, in the sky, in the clouds, right? You're at one billion. 30 times up the scale, roughly 40 years. The kids of my kids will not know how to drive a car. They will not know what a CD looks like. They may not know what a book looked like. They will have unlimited energy in terms of, you know, energy that we can use for heating and those kind of things. They will solve diseases. They will see things that are literally out of science fiction. Many of them good, other ones more worrisome. So I put together this map in my book called The Mega Shifts, and I'm not going to talk about all of them because that would take all night. But uh, basically, it's not just digitization, you know, what's called digital transformation. It is also what's happening with cognification, that machines can actually think, uh, which I'll show you shortly. And robots, I mean, robots have become so cheap, it's going to be absolutely mind-boggling. So there's four mega shifts I'll, I'll talk about in more detail. One is that everything is becoming data. You heard about big data and you know, basically the in the medical field, that is, of course, a huge boon. I mean, in Switzerland, we don't allow people to go into the cloud quite yet because we haven't figured out how to safeguard the data. And that's a very big issue. But imagine if we were able to connect all of the health records of, you know, say, two billion people. I mean, the things that we can learn from that, we could, that's called cloud biology, right? We can actually do simulations. The other thing is artificial intelligence, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. That essentially the concept that a machine can do what people used to do. Okay. And that is the number one investment in the world now. The US is leading the market along with China and then Russia and India. So this is basically the idea of, of teaching a machine to kind of be like us, you know, in, in, a, in broad strokes, okay? Uh, and that, is, that goes together with the Internet of Things, you know, connected devices, cars, environmental systems. And finally, this is the big one for, for you guys, of course, in, in this area, is the human genome editing. I mean, this is, of course, the biggest the biggest potential that we see roughly 25 years from now is to say, well, if we know exactly what genome is doing what, and if we have enough trials, simulations, we may be able to prevent cancer. May. Right? Big question. But you know, there's already 27 companies in California and Silicon Valley that have on their website that they are working on the end of death. Uh, the end of dying. This is, sounds like a joke, right? Uh, check out this company, Human Longevity Inc. Right? And their idea is to uh, offer genome treatments to keep us from aging. Not entirely new, but with a new kind of science behind it. Science fiction, I'm not sure. I think that's basically going to be uh, quite a, a scenario. There is a discussion that we're seeing in Silicon Valley about what's called the singularity. And the singularity is at the point in time where machines have the power of the human brain. Okay. That's roughly seven to ten years away. A uh, human brain can do roughly 400 quadrillion calculations per second. And it's unknown what that really means as far as the neurons and so are concerned. Right? But a machine can do that now, but this machine is as big as this room. So roughly in seven to ten years, this machine right here will have the same capacity than my brain. And then Kurzweil, my colleague in Futurism, says that in 2050 we'll have a machine that has the capacity of all human brains. Ten billion. So an IQ of, I don't know, a million? Does that make them human? I doubt it, right? Because, you know, after all, they're just zeros and ones. But there's a lot of things going on under that hood, right? I'll, I'll show you some of that. But basically what's happening here is quite clearly, you know, in the very near future, we're all going to live and see this, and this is not a bad thing. The question will not if technology can do something, because the answer will always be yes. 
The question is why and who. Because basically in roughly 10 years, technology will be unlimited. Quantum computing, mobile connectivity, new nanoscience for devices, so we don't have to use the raw earth materials. That's roughly 10 years away. Imagine if you, uh, if you had the power to change your, your kid's genome upon birth. And who's to say what would be right or wrong? I mean, never mind the religious parts of this. I'll leave this up for a different discussion. Right? This is just practical and ethical debates about, you know, should it be free? The European Commission says that roughly to develop a, uh, a genome therapy would cost 35 trillion euros, right? roughly 45 trillion dollars. But the actual therapy to prevent cancer would take four seconds. So if we're able to do that, would we have to give it away for free? Uh, you may be familiar with Cymria, which is the first drug approved by the FDA. That is a leukemia drug. It's a gene therapy for leukemia. So for some really difficult cases, this is the only chance they have. Novartis right? developed this. The drug costs $475,000. And it's a money back guarantee if you die, you don't pay. Right? That's what Novartis says. Right? So it's a very strange way of looking at the world. Imagine if that became a standard for things. I mean, obviously, that would cause a lot of unrest. You know? So let me go to Switzerland and democracy. I'll come back to the other stuff in a second. So I live in a beautiful place. Well, that's not where I live, but that's Switzerland. Right? Uh, I'm a Swiss citizen and a German citizen, and also I was an American citizen. I had to give one of them up to become Swiss, so sorry about that. But I, I did live here for 17 years, so I'm, I still feel very American in many ways. Um, so in Switzerland, we have a very distinct uh, culture. You know, seven million people. That's like the size of Manhattan. You know, I don't know, very small. Uh, drive through the country in three and a half hours, north, south, both ways. Right? You've been there. And we, every year, we get these amazing ratings. For example, we have been the most innovative country in the world for years. I don't exactly know what the metrics are, but if you ask Swiss people, they don't agree. Which often happens. You know, when you ask people in the country, are we the most innovative? They say, what, really? I mean, this is an amazing list, right? Because we have a lot of research, for example, EPFL, ETH, and you know, a lot of that stuff is happening. And then the strongest democracies. I don't know where the US is on this list. I will not discuss that with you, but but uh, the top 10, <laughs> it probably has moved down this list in the last six months. But in any case, uh, we're always on top of that list as well, right? because we have a special democracy, which I'll talk about in a second. And it's the happiest country in the world, along with Denmark and Iceland. No longer true for Iceland, I think, now, but Denmark. Funny thing about that is, of course, Denmark is now, I think, in this year's research, this was last year, 2015. Uh, in 2017, Denmark is number one, but it's also the, mo the country where people take the most antidepressants. Which <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that's kind of a strange, you know, maybe you get happy because you take all that stuff all the time. But, but uh, anyway, so Switzerland is doing really good on the ranking here, and it's, it's definitely a country that is uh, an interesting example of this, right? So, we have direct democracy, which means four times a year, uh, a big box, you know, basically a big envelope shows up at your, at your doorstep in your mailbox, and it's all the stuff that you're supposed to read and vote on. Four times a year. And some of that is very trivial, like the size of a sausage. Yeah, yeah we had a vote on that, a referendum, right? Because people were starting to make different sausages that people wouldn't approve of. Uh, because, you know, it's very important that the sausages the right length, and, you know, so we had a vote on that. But it's stuff like nuclear energy, immigration. We have three forms. One is mandatory, which is changing the constitution. That is mandatory. You have to collect 100,000 valid signatures for your petition, which is quite big in Switzerland. And then you go to the federal council, and they can, they can approve to put that up for voting. So 100,000 people is quite a threshold, right? And then we have 
referendums, which this is the, uh, the difficult part, where basically 50,000 people can go and say, okay, or the cantons, which is the local governments, right? They object a law that's already in place and redo it. So if the government of Switzerland decides that they're going to, you know, allow gen genome research and experiments on humans, then people can put together a referendum and vote it down and go backwards. Okay. Biggest example was in 2002. Very unpopular vote against foreigners in Switzerland. Uh, you know, I, I immigrated in 2002, so I got in just in time. But this includes Germans and Europeans, not, you know, anyone really. So we have in Switzerland roughly two million people who are, who live in the mountains and they don't like any foreigner. Right? And that includes people from the next canton. Right? Um, but in any case, so there was a referendum on, on the stopping immigration basically, which is very bad for Switzerland because, you know, we, we have a shortage of workers, a shortage of professors, a shortage of pretty much anything. Right? And the Conservative Party launched this referendum, and it was, uh, it was accepted by a margin of 3,000 votes. I mean, 3,000 votes, that's like, you know, very small. So what happened is that the government had to execute the people's opinion that immigration should be curtailed. And that became a major issue because all of a sudden we had this, right, in this beautiful country, we had to figure out how we're going to execute it, and then at the same time keep in with government policy in Europe, right? which is basically mission impossible. Right? So, for example, if you're, if you're a German citizen, you could no longer come and work in Switzerland. And then, basically, the Swiss government figured out a way how to massage the people's opinion into policy, right? how to kind of go against it, but not overtly. It was a 15-year process. Right? So here's the question I have about this here. When issues become exponentially complex, how will citizens be able to make the right decision? I mean, I, this is my job to know about these things, right? But when I get this box from the election office and it has all that stuff in it, I give it to my wife too, for her to figure out what we should vote for, right? Because it takes two and a half hours to work through that. And I'm, you know, it's an average of 42% or so that vote. It's not very high. So it's, it's, a, it's sort of a dual-sided question. I think in a, in a world that's going exponentially fast, where basically you will not understand the world in 10 years, if you were to visit from here then, you would be dumbfounded. So it's a difficult thing to decide, you know, which way are we going. Here's a trend map that uh, you see many of these maps. All the stuff that goes on today that if you're not an expert, you would just say, oh God, you know, this is just, you know, where can I hide? Right? The blockchain, genomics, drones, smart grids, connected cars, smart homes, you know, the list goes on. And in healthcare, you know, this is a revolution. I think, again, mostly positive, but definitely not so easy to understand. It's a lot of issues and concerns. So is a direct democracy the right tool to administer that? We're having lots of debates about this in Switzerland because it's one of the foundations of the Swiss culture. But imagine you know, the government works on something really powerful and, and figures out a way to go forward, and a year later somebody launches a referendum and says, no, no, let's go backwards, and then the government has to scrap everything and then execute the will of the people who managed to get together. That can be great. I'm not so sure that's a way into the future. So direct democracy, I think for us it's working, but what it does in the future, we'll come back to in a second. Let me talk about intelligent machines. Uh, this is very timely because uh, basically what's happening in computing is that if you grew up in the first edition of computing, tabulating and programmed machines, they would essentially be as dumb as a toaster. Right? I mean, they would do whatever you tell them to do. You know, run a calculation, do a spreadsheet. But now, there's this thing called cognitive computing, which allows machines to read all the data, for example, genome, genomic data, oncology data, healthcare data, traffic data, and then make sense out of it by running a huge amount of data together. 
for example, in human resources, now in the corporate environment, people use all that data about their employees. Big companies run all of the data, all of the emails you're writing, all of your social media posts, when you come into the office, and on, and this data analyzes who you are. It's standard procedure for many large companies. And then it says this person is the most productive or not. Kind of a scary thought, but this is kind of the computer does your thinking. So do uh, you guys know Airbnb? Familiar with Airbnb? Yeah, everybody is. Yeah. You want to rent your house on Airbnb? You don't have to figure out how much you should charge. You tell Airbnb where you are. Right? It looks up all of the data, and that's sometimes 200 million data points of your city, the crime rate, the hotel charges. Right? And then the AI, the, the machine, right, says your, your place is worth $74 a night. They do that for you. So that is a kind of example of smart thinking. Basically what's happening here is that we're now entering an age where computers are listening to us. They understand what we're saying. They can talk to us. They can understand our meaning. And they're no longer programmed. Well, that's just starting to happen. Right? In, in the medical area, area that means IBM Watson is the leading contender here. It looks at all of the MRIs, all the CAT scans, all of, all of the stuff that you have. It reads 4,000 or so new oncology reports a week. It puts all the data together and it knows all of the numbers. It still doesn't understand the human behind it, right? But it certainly has a lot of knowledge, you know, as far as numbers are concerned. So, that is a future dramatically different. Alexa, dim. Play that example from Alexa. Uh, Alexa is now the leading device also coming into the doctor's office, office now, right? So basically what is happening is people are building what's called skills, which are like apps, you know, for Alexa, for this machine. So banks, doctors, travel agents, and you can speak to the machine and have it do things for us. So example is this one. Alexa, dim the lights. Alexa, play happy birthday. It's a trivial example, but think about the next step that are quite obvious. You say, well, Alexa, I need to invest $10,000 in environmentally sensitive companies. Alexa goes off and, and figures out what has been good performing. It, looks, it, it replaces your banker, essentially. Right? That part of banking. That's already happening. In the medical field, that's going to become a standard that you sit down and say, you know, check with my, uh, what's my status health-wise. Right? And we'll say, oh, you're doing pretty good, but you should really not smoke that cigar in the evening. Right? We'll give you some comments like this. That's called machine learning. It's hard to understand how that works, but basically it's you know, safe to say that we're getting into a world where the machine, the artificial intelligence, can tell us things. And that's, if, you, if you're using Google Maps, that's what it does. If you're using Gmail, it gives you automatic responses. If you're using Facebook, it gives you automatic updates from the things that you may like. That's machine intelligence. Now imagine what this will do for democracy. If we have devices telling us at every turn, and they're getting very good at this, what is the best thing to do, where we go shopping, why Amazon is better than Walmart, and you know, why we go to Whole Foods or not, or whatever. Right? It could be fantastic because it's very convenient. So now that the first websites where you can find a partner you know, through a cloud like this, an intelligent cloud, where you talk to the machine, and the machine talks to the potential partner and connects you, uh, based on voice profiles, and it's like speed dating, you know, in a way. So this is really what ha what's happening here. Let's define intelligence very simply as the ability to accomplish complex tasks. We all have that. And that's quite different than a machine because, you know, you can take a machine that beats the world champion in Go or in chess, but the same machine couldn't drive your car, it couldn't talk to your kids. It is very narrow. Right? 
And we can do, I mean, we can drive in the US and you can probably drive in the UK if you try hard. You can even drive in India because you can adapt. Right? Machines can't quite do this yet, but you know, artificial intelligence is really this, right? It's the fact that machines can start doing what we used to do. Okay? And that is something that we're going to see everywhere. Right? And I tell you, a lot of people are worried about this because of jobs. I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, my view is that the machines will take our tasks, our routines. That is certain. I mean, if you're a bookkeeper, it's quite clear that the machine can eventually, in the next five years, learn bookkeeping quite perfectly. There's, I mean, there are some things about creative bookkeeping, right? But basically, bookkeeping is just a job of numbers, right? It's a job that you have to do well, and it takes certain knowledge, but it's not, it's not like you're going to write a book or something, right? Or, or perform a dance. Right? So basically, what's happening here is that We've seen in the movies, you know, what artificial intelligence looks like. We should forget all of that because that's entertainment. You know? We are hundreds of years away from machines being human, if ever, right? for, for various reasons. But what we are seeing is self-driving cars. Right? So this is not really artificial intelligence like the ex machina. This is really intelligent assistance. You know, these are that's called IA basically, right? not AI. And these are machines that can basically do human functions in a certain way. If you're foolish enough, you can make the Tesla crash, right? No problem. But it can drive just fine in a traffic jam. Or machines can work in a warehouse, like this is Amazon's warehouse, fully automated. I mean, these machines are dumb, right? They're, but they're doing a good job doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And then you have robots now, like Baxter. This robot is $25,000. You can teach the robot to do anything, including lifting your grandmother out of the bath, if, if that's what's desired. I mean, it's, a, it's the first robot that's actually safe for humans to use. And this robot, of course, is a great competition for any manual job, for example, fixing a car. And that's... Those machines are getting rapidly cheaper. Roughly, Baxter will cost about $5,000 in three or four years. So prices going like this. And then you have things like Google Lens, which is your, it's the latest thing from Google where you can hold up the mobile phone over a location and it will tell you what it is. I mean, that's not exactly like going to Mars, you know, but that's pretty smart when, you know, you're visiting somebody's house and you scan, you, you hold the thing over, over a book and it will just load the book, right? I mean, a human could do that in a, with anything, right? But it's quite hard for tech to do that. This is my favorite, is the first robot lawyer. Right? So any, any lawyers in the room, this is, a, this is a thing called do not pay, okay? Uh, and it's a bot, it's a messenger. You can try it on the internet, do not pay.co.uk. Uh, and you can, you can sue Equifax using this. Right? So you give it your case number, you can contend your parking ticket. If you got a parking ticket in New York or London, you can have the bot file a complaint. Right? Uh, and this is, uh, if you want the non-disclosure agreement, the bot will do it for you. Right? So it's, I mean, this is also kind of primitive in many ways, but no, it's still very useful. So imagine next time you, you get to um, Chicago and the airport is closed and, you have, and United has to rebook, I don't know, 15,000 people. No more calling. You go to the bot. The bot knows who you are, has all your information. It does the same thing that you have to wait in line for at the airport in 14 seconds on your mobile. So that's really what's happening with artificial intelligence, all the things that we're seeing here. Quite mind-boggling. Oh, here's the, the, uh, this one. I, want, I didn't want to keep this one. Uh, first trials here in the US. This would not be uh, legal, by the way, in Europe, but here it is. Uh, using software to decide on probation. So this is already happening. And, and so what is happening here is that uh, the uh, correctional facility, the jail, essentially films the, the prison of the entire time, collects all of the data, 
And then the machine looks at all the footage, looks at all the data, looks at all the information, and says, this person shouldn't go on probation because they're likely to do it again. That's what the judge does, right? The judge, you know, judge has a bad day, nobody gets to go, right? And that's the argument. Of course, you know, it's quite clear that statistics show decisions based on the machine were better than the judge. Does it make it right? That's the key question. My view is the judge should use the machine to get information to make better decisions. Imagine what would happen to democracy if we let the machine decide on policy. When should we nuke North Korea? The machine can tell us. I mean, we could basically look at this as a replacement of people. How far would we go with this? So that's a really uh, difficult issue because the bottom line really is this, right? If you're looking at the brain and how we work, we have what's called social intelligence. So we would know when we're misbehaving or when we're not supposed to, you know, blame somebody or we would have this kind of feeling about each other. Some of us even have emotional intelligence. That's very hard to describe what that is. Right? So we, we have compassion or empathy or, you know, it's, this is actually not really clear what that is. And then we have intellectual intelligence, of course, we know what that is. And then we have nothing, and then we have machines. Right? Machines don't have any of this. They, they have kind of intellectual intelligence. Yeah. But if a machine can figure out how to reroute the traffic in New York City or Los Angeles by looking at 1.5 trillion data feeds and then save 10% of energy or gas, and make it faster, humans could never do that. We can't keep that much data. So machines are currently doing that, and that is the future of machines. Right? And that will have impact on society, and then we have to figure out how far do we go. Right? And where exactly do we go? For example, Putin, our good friend, says that whoever is first to have the most powerful artificial intelligence will rule the world. Of course, we know that who, who that is going to be, right? It's going to be Russia, of course. But So Russia, China, US, India, that's the four competitors. Right? And that, I think, is a, it's a huge challenge for democracy also, because imagine what would happen when we have such systems in place. Do we still have control over that? That brings me to the, to the issue of what I call digital ethics. Okay. And let me say in the beginning, that ethics has nothing to do with religion. As the Dalai Lama said, ethics is more important than religion. That's what he said. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just presenting it for discussion. Because there's things that make us human that nobody wants to miss, that are not optional. And I think the ethics that we're looking at right now is basically what technology is doing is what I call hell then. It's heaven and it's hell. Take the example of genome therapy. If one day we can prevent cancer by genomic therapy, which is the goal, some people say, roughly 25 years. If we can save one single life with that, we absolutely must do that. But on the other hand, we can use that very same process, mostly based on what is now called CRISPR-Cas9 and the, the cutting of genomes, which is already widely used for vegetables and GMO and even animals. When we can do that, we can also program our kids. It's the same technology. And that brings up this dilemma. We cannot really afford not to do it because we can, we can do a lot of good things here. But then, you know, we have to figure out how to govern it. That is our primary challenge. So I always say the future is better than we think but we have to make it so. Right? We have to govern it correctly. Like in this case with the genome therapy, we would have to say what is okay and what is not okay. And who decides that? So we may end up, you know, as of course the other thing that's happening there is longevity. You know, it's an average true that uh, we are gaining one third of a year of lifespan every single year we're alive. All of us in the West. The kids of my kids will, if it all goes according to that plan, right, they will live an average of 95 years. 
and we will eventually get in the next 50 years to 120 years lifespan. So then you can retire with 60 and go on a cruise ship for 60 years. <laughs> oh, well, we'll go to Mars or something, I don't know. But, so imagine, imagine the issues for democracy and for government. Like retirement, for example, you're going to have retirement for 50 years? We don't even have it now for five years. <laughs> we have enough issues with that. Right? And then we have machines doing all the work, you know, that's called the Internet of Things. You know? Connecting cities, what's called a smart city, you know? smart farming, you know, it's smart logistics. We're essentially creating sort of a meta-intelligence. So you heard about the Internet of Things, but the bottom line on this is really, as Cisco says, you know, the tech company says, we're going to have 700 billion connected devices. Our cars, you heard about the smart home, right? our, our banking, our health records. So I, clearly that could be fantastic, but there's lots of issues about you know, who's controlling that, who's, who may be abusing it, who's responsible. And I think that comes down to governance. We can't just invent something and then say, well, you know, something went wrong and 100 million DNA records got copied. So you could have a clone. It would be unfortunate, I suppose. But So basically what's happening is, you know, what we see today is that technology has given us some amazing advantages like free phone calls and all these things, but it could also be used as a weapon. So artificial intelligence, quantum computing, the blockchain, um, genome therapy. So does that mean we shouldn't invent the technology, we shouldn't use it? Well, that, that is not an option, right? especially not here. I mean, this place is one of the places inventing a lot of this. Right? And a lot of research is being done on, on the things like genome therapy and the future of medicine and so on and so on. We don't really have a choice not to be part of this. So what we need to do is to find a common place to where we can use it for the common good. Right? Because basically what's already happening is quite gear. You know, Arana Huffington from the Huffington Post said that technology has been very good at giving us what we want, which is great technology. People love their mobile phones. Right? Uh, essentially, you could say the mobile devices are kind of becoming an obsession, right? Um, but they have not become as good as giving us what we need, which is to connect with each other. So technology has in many ways actually replaced this. So I'd like to say that basically at this point, uh, it's quite clear that what we have most important to us, you know, trust isn't digital, happiness is not an app, it's not a device, it's not a program. Relationships aren't code. Humans aren't machines. At least I believe that humans aren't machines. You would be surprised how many people do believe that humans are machines. Fancy machines. So there's a kind of a, uh, you know, there's a, a challenge for us because humans are the most inefficient as compared to machines. Right? We make mistakes. We make up stories. We lie, we don't show up, we may be sick, we change our mind. Have you ever met a machine that's changing its mind? Or that's making up a story? So in many ways you could say that humans are the opposite of machines. We're completely on the other equation. And that goes for efficiency as well. I mean, I can't tell you how many of my clients are saying, we're going to use technology to replace as many people as possible because that's what brings up the margin. Telecom companies, banks, insurance companies, government, the Social Security Administration. It's quite clear that when you use efficiency, you need less people, you have smarter machines. Right? So here's the interesting part about democracy, as I was saying earlier. Democracy relies on preserving what makes us human. It relies on things that are not part of a machine. Sorry about that. It's supposed to come in there. So it's actually democracy doesn't have much to do with efficiency because you could say that democracy is essentially not efficient, as I was saying earlier. 
Should we remove that because it's too slow? Should we have just one person decide because it's fast? Probably not a good idea. So one of the key issues here is that you know, we have this temptation that we think of technology you know, automation as the holy grail. And the key issue really is we have to think about what should not be automated. What should not be connected? What should not be optimized? Because if the world was about optimization, we wouldn't exist. Well, we would constantly fail all of that. Right? Because we would constantly fail to do, to do what the machines can do best. So challenges are, when we think about technology, again, I'm an optimist on this. I think we can work all this out. But there are challenges that we should talk about. First of all, some people think that uh, democracy could be kind of a burning platform, which means like doomed to fail. Because technology is moving so fast and politics is woefully behind. Right? In Europe now we have a proposal that if you want to go into politics, you have to pass the technology test. Right? You have to understand all the items that I already lined out earlier to prove that you are future ready, what we call future ready. Uh, I think that would be an interesting example and to figure out where that could be going. You see already here that 52% worldwide, this is uh, um, Pew Research Center, uh, latest uh, research, 52% are not satisfied with their democracy. Higher than ever before. And that is primarily, I think, because people are worried about the future. I mean, I get to hear this every day. I'll tell you why I think that is basically because of this, right? We are just humans. We're learning linearly. We're, we're getting to be a little bit older. We understand more stuff. We're getting smarter, but only in a very slow pace. I mean, basically what, hap what happens here is that at this point, we can look at technology and say, yeah, I'm a better driver than the Tesla car. Right? 10 years, finished. Right? Not a chance. The curve goes like this. Technology can do just about anything better than we can that is a routine. Driving a truck, doing the bookkeeping, financial advice, looking at, uh, at uh, MRI scans, diagnosis, 10 years. So basically, we have to wonder about where this is going to leave us. Right? I mean, basically, this is the question about ethics. As it has been defined by Potter Stewart as the difference between having a right to do something or the power and doing what is the right thing to do. That is the most basic, basic definition. It's something we have to think about when we talk about the future because you know, these days there's increasing what I call future shock. In the US, not as much in some ways. That is quite a different story. But in Europe, you know, people are saying, well, What's going to happen you know, when technology becomes that good? The Oxford report says 55% of jobs will be automated away. I mean, in America, that means uh, two and a half million truckers, four and a half million people working in fast food. You know, Burger King and McDonald's are both developing places that is the entire place is run by one person. It's already highly automated if you've ever been inside of a, of a McDonald's. It will probably taste even better you know, when, when uh, there's just one person doing it. But I mean, that brings up a huge challenge. right? What do we do with all those people? Catalonia, Spain. Right? You heard about the recent, this is my favorite place in Catalonia called Caracas. Uh, fantastic place to go to. Uh, and my colleague Parakana says basically what's happening is that we have a devolution, a decentralization of power because of technology, right? because technology makes it possible. So the Catalan people want to be independent, the Lombardia people want to be independent, the Scottish people want to be independent, right? because technology makes it possible. It's a very, very big uh, discussion about this and where that's going. So let me talk about work and jobs, and then we'll open up the round for some questions very soon. So just as a reminder, I put together this little rotating thing here. So a lot of people that I talk to there, are, they tend to say that basically we are the horses 
of the digital age. You know what happened to horses. You know, we used to have horses do all the work and ride them and go places, and, and the horses, you know, we had the car and the railway, the horses went out. Right? So now a lot of people are saying, well, is that what's going to happen to us? You know, as machines come smart, we become like the horses, so, you know, keep them as a toy or something. You know? I don't think that's quite true. Uh, we have to give humans more credits than that, right? Uh, than the horses, because, you know, in the end it comes down to this, right? The Technology is going to enable us to do some pretty amazing things. The doctor that makes the rounds in the hospital that has a tiny robot that has the entire world's library of everything ever known about diseases, real-time updates with many other doctors. Right? That machine can be used to the detriment, which is to make the, the uh, doctor work even faster, or it can be used as a solution to have him go back and check something, right? to actually talk to the patient. There's been lots of research with doctors saying that many doctors say, well, if I have this machine, I save time researching and looking up things. I can build a conversation. Right? I can spend more time with the patient. Could it be potentially making you dependent? Yes, of course. Right? Big question. So take a look at the economic stats, basically saying that uh, it's quite clear that uh, the blue bar here is the jobs are likely to be automated. Telemarketers, almost 100%. Accountants, 94%. Retail salespeople, 90%. You know. You know what's safe at the top of the pyramid? Priests, clergy, dancers. They're not on the list here, but dentists, firefighters. So does that mean doom and gloom? I don't think it does. I think what it really means is that machines are very good at doing the monkey work. Okay. Now, if you're an accountant putting a, a, a receipt from left to right, and, and you know, that is kind of a, a job that a machine will eventually master, right? that, that can be done. Now, the question is, what do we do with this? And the, the answer really is that you can see on this graph already from The Economist that anything that's not routine is going up. Right? Non-routine cognitive work. Most of people in this room would probably do that. And non-routine manual work. Plumbers, electricians, artists, cooks, therapists. Well, manual, but non-routine work. Right? Don't let your kids learn anything that can be made a routine. And that is the key to the future. So in many ways, you know, we, we teach our kids to work like robots, to fulfill some sort of plan. Right? Our kids have to be the opposite of robots. They have to be inventive, enterprising, flexible, Agile, creative, imaginative, a pain in the butt, basically. Right? <laughs> I can tell you from my own kids, that's the case. So that is the key for the future, because this is the bottom line, right? Anything that can be automated or digitized will be. Because computers are no longer done. And there's so many hurdles why that didn't work, but now it's going to work. Ten years, end of the story. So that brings up huge, I mean, the biggest issue for America is not the globalization, right? it's automation. And so that's what we have to address with education, because the bottom line is also true the other way around. Right? Anything that cannot be digitized or automated becomes extremely valuable. Right? That is understanding, creativity, compassion, values, empathy, things that a computer will never, hopefully, be able to have. The machine can understand emotions, right? It can read my face and you can say, oh, Gerd is angry or he's tired. Uh, the machine can do that and then you can say, I, I pretend to be tired as well, right? The machine can do that, but it can't actually be angry because it doesn't exist. Right? There's, a, there's a vast difference here. Right? In German, the word Dasein means existence. We exist, and that brings up a whole different level. So in, in terms of education and our future, clearly our kids have to understand technology or, or they, they're going to be toast. I mean, that's totally clear. Right? But why would you let the kids, my kids, learn how to be a programmer? Right? Machines can program themselves. Right? My kids have to be better humans. Right? They have to understand compassion, figure out what to do, invent their own jobs. 
Lots of research on the other end says roughly 70% of all new jobs in 10 years have not even been invented yet. So the kids, your kids and the kids of my kids, they'll invent their own job because they're, they're there. Right? Technology will make it possible. The most popular job now, new job, is a drone operator. I'm not talking about the military here. Right? Civil drone operator. Hundreds of thousands of them are being hired in Africa to fly food and medication and stuff where there are no roads. Right? These jobs didn't exist a couple of years ago. So that's kind of good news. Uh, clearly, we're going to move to a world where our skills are changing. The World Economic Forum says, you know, this is going to be like this. Basically, the old skills from a year ago, two years ago, the new skills are different. And those skills are highly different, right? Critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility. It's basically the skills of an artist, you could say, more or less, right? Right brain, you know, there's no such thing as right brain, left brain, but let's say for the, for the practical purpose, not the logical part, right? but the other part. Because this is what's going to happen to logic. Right? <laughs> I mean, make no doubt about this. If that's your job, it will be taken. Right? Includes my own job, by the way. The other day, I had a, a great experience in New York. I, w I went to a company that makes artificially intelligent machines. And uh, I was able to speak to the latest prototype. Uh, I can tell you which one, but I, I talked to her. It's always a woman for some reason. And I, I asked the machine about the future of Europe. What is the future of Europe? The machine gave me a 10-minute talk okay, in a completely normal female voice. I could have sworn was like 98% real, and it was intelligent. I was talking about currency fluctuation, the end of oil, you know, all of that, 10 minutes. I was thinking like, God, that's kind of my job, right? <laughs> but it actually isn't my job, because then when I asked the machine, the next question I said, can you tell me about this concept I'm working on called the United States of Europe, right? which is a concept, as I'm sure you understand. Right? Machine didn't say anything. I repeated, and the machine said, command not understood. Right? It's because the United States of Europe doesn't exist. It is a, it is a concept, right? It's an idea. Computer doesn't know. So I think that is our future also. I think in the medical profession, clearly we're going to move into this part where we have different skills, where we're going to look at a different way of society. So I'm going to skip some of this because otherwise we won't get to the questions. You can start preparing because you, you can see I was vastly optimistic on the, on the number of slides I was going to uh, <laughs> indulge you with. Right? So let, let's skip this one and talk about this. Right? Basically what's happening already, as I'm sure you're aware of, that technology is increasingly moving across the line towards what I call dehumanization. Facebook has an algorithm that works on your face. Right? Literally, that's used by the FBI and the CIA, and they're using it in the back end. So whatever photos you put up on, on Facebook, they scan every part of your muscle, they figure out if you're angry or tired or, you know, all that stuff is happening behind the, behind the scenes. Right? You cannot search for that, but Facebook knows that most of the time you come there, you're drunk, right? for example. <laughs> right? I mean, Facebook, and Facebook knows more about you with photos and WhatsApp than anybody that would ever physically know you. Right? I mean, the old joke was five years ago, Google knows more about you than your husband or your wife. Right? Because you Google and you ask, you know, what do I do with my fungus nail or, you know, whatever, right? All that combined is vast. Right? So now we're basically seeing all these things, you know, where basically then Elon Musk, you know, the Tesla CEO is suggesting we should create a connection from the neuro, uh, neocortex to the Internet so we can keep up with the smart machines. We're having all kinds of discussions about this. I mean, we're, we're seeing technology creating all kinds of issue. And Mark Anderson, Anderson from um, Netscape originally, uh, he, he said this in 2011, software is eating the world, right? Everything is becoming software. Music has become software. Shopping has become software. Books are software. Films are software. Cars are software. 
basically. I always say that uh, we should be careful that software isn't going to cheat the world. Like this is what happens on social media, right? We're inside of a group of friends, we get feedback from people, we see the things that we're supposed to see, we feel good about the likes, but the whole thing is run by a giant computer. And I'm sure you heard about the story, what's happening with Facebook is that uh, it's quite clear, there's no, you know, people are still probing on this, right, that people used social media, uh, particularly Facebook, as a platform for disinformation. Right? For essentially what's, uh, what they call sowing dissent, right? is to get people worried, basically. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, the founder of eBay, Pierre Omidya, he said that basically what happened here is that social media has found, uh, has, been, has become a place where that's possible. And this is where it impacts democracy. I mean, regardless of your opinion about Trump or the Republicans or any political opinion, manipulating what we think through a medium that is not clear as to what it says and what it is, is a considerable problem. I mean, when, if you watch Fox television, you know what to expect, right? If you watch PBS, you know what to expect. This is a regular medium, you know, they, have, they actually have editors, right? But this is a, an algorithm that people can buy. $17 million a month was spent on influencing U.S. elections. Is that fair? I, I can't really think that's a good idea, right? I mean, looking at this, right? The fact is 45% of American kids get their news on Facebook, only on Facebook. And there's no editor on Facebook, there's no, there's no responsibility, there's no accountability. Facebook keeps saying we're not a medium. Now this is not good for democracy, clearly not. And I've tried leaving Facebook, you know. <laughs> I tried two times, it's like a drug addict, yeah. But it's Facebook's kind of an infrastructure now. So when I, if I quit Facebook, my traffic goes down 70% to my website. Right? Facebook is a fact of life now. So what do we need to do? Right? The cheating the world idea, right? It's basically protecting us from things that we don't want to see. That is not good for democracy. Because it's, it's, uh, it's creating what's called a, a feedback loop, right? A, an echo chamber, right? a filter bubble. And of course, you know, uh, Facebook has almost 400 uh, neuroscientists and, and scientific personnel working on addiction right? to make sure you come back to Facebook. So it's a, it's a, it's a real dilemma. This is another one that's happening in China, right? They're, they're developing software that can scan the entire traffic no matter how you're driving or moving, right, to make sure that uh, people do what they're supposed to do. Of course, in China, that's not a problem, considering that we don't have any rights in China, no matter how you look at it. <laughs> but I mean, clearly endangering democracy. And uh, now there'll be a universal credit system in China. In 2020, every single person will have a rating from one to 100 as to how important and valuable you are and what your credit is. And if you don't have 71, you're not going to get that special night in the, in the Palace Hotel or so because you don't qualify. Huh? That's like Black Mirror you've seen. The, uh, it's, it's quite scary, right? So let me summarize. Okay. This is a, a defining moment in democracy. We have to use technology for the good, and there's plenty of that happening. I mean, the fact that we can watch Netflix for 10 dollars a month, we can watch 200,000 movies that used to be $25 for one DVD, right? That's pretty amazing. We can make free phone calls, we can do all that stuff, that's really good stuff. But we still have to be careful that technology doesn't grow into a place where we can safely say, well, it will be mostly negative for us. And who would control that? You know, so technology companies are now the most powerful companies in the world. In fact, I need to show you the slide that I, that I skipped. <laughs> Just give me a second, I'll we'll pull, it, pull it up, because I think you need to see that statistic to, um, to see the context here. 
So in the meantime, you can think of a question. Okay. So here you can see the most powerful companies in the world all in one chart. It is no longer the oil companies, which were the most powerful companies, or the banks. That's bad for Switzerland, but that's true. The top 20 companies are technology companies. And they're doing in many ways what the oil companies used to do. Uh, they're, they're essentially running the world. And all of this, uh, almost all of those guys are my clients. So I have first-hand experience of talking to them about the, the world view that they have and where they're going with this, right? just to give you some background information. Okay. Let me go back to this. So here's a, here's the key question. Right? Who will be mission control for humanity? Who will decide what is right or wrong, or what we should or should not do? Or right? well, you know where mission control is currently located. Right? It's Silicon Valley. Right? Now they have the most money. They invent the most things. They're the most, they're the most entrepreneurial, and for good reason because they risk everything every day. Right? They're pioneers. But the key question really is ultimately when they're starting to develop things, for example, connecting our brain to the internet, or human genome therapy, or you know, they impact everything that we do, what do we do about this? Essentially, we're looking at a future where technology is now capable of doing a lot of things that we haven't imagined. And some people would say, well, you know, that's kind of like you know, game over for us. I don't agree, but Elon Musk says, you know, Tesla CEO and founder, says there should be some sort of regulatory oversight. He's already gone, Elon Musk. Come back, please. Okay, sorry about that. To where I have my own quote, Elon Musk said, by the way, I need to play that again, sorry about that. For some reason, that was timed a little bit bad. But basically, he's saying that we need to have some oversight because technology is so powerful now. And, uh, of course, he is creating a lot of that technology, which is an interesting point. Right? So he basically says we have to have oversight so that we make sure we don't do something stupid with technology, which are, there's plenty of options for that. Right? And I like to say that basically what we have to do is we have the most promising future as one where we don't postpone innovation and science, but we don't dismiss the exponential risk either. Right? We basically can't say that whatever is the risk of artificial intelligence or robotics, somebody else will take care of it. That does remind you, in a way, of the gun lobby, right? Somebody else will take care of the problems that come out of it. No matter what you're thinking about this, same logic. We need to think about this and say, well, if these things are dramatically changing what we are and how democracy works, if Facebook is actually manipulating 40% of the entire population into di thinking differently, does that call for something? Very big question. And, you know, I think what we need is, you know, we, the EPA isn't uh, exactly fashionable anymore. Well, let's say it has kind of ceased to exist. Um, but I think we sort of need an EPA for humanity. We need a protection agency for what makes us human. Which are inefficiency, emotions, things that only humans can do, compassion, empathy, imagination, free will. The day will come that we're going to see that uh, we are not, no longer allowed to drive. Because the ma machines will have learned how to drive and then our free will is gone at that point because basically, you know, we just kill people when we drive, right? So we're very hard, you know, 1.2 million people a year, in fact, we kill. Right? So do we need something like a digital ethics council? I think it has been discussed on a, on a global level in many different ways. So here's a couple of uh, things and then we'll take some questions. Uh, bottom line is that we need to think about this as uh, creating some principles and the Future of Life Institute also funded by Elon Musk, has come up with four. First, all technology should respect human values. Human dignity, rights, freedoms, cultural diversity. Second, 
it should all create shared benefit and prosperity. Right now, we can safely say that technology hasn't really done that. It has, in fact, created more inequality. And if we are going to see the day where we have a therapy for cancer, we'll have to be free. How would that work in the, in the capitalist system? I have no idea. You know, it's going to cost 30 trillion. Hard to figure out. We have to think of ecosystems. We have to think of everything around what we're building. Not just think of, uh, for example, Uber is looking to displace the taxi drivers. Well, that's great, but if they're all displaced, will it just be Uber that wants everything? Big concern. Huh? Responsibility. Those that design and build this are responsible. If IBM Watson is going to redo the medical business as they, they want, if the pharma companies are going to be reset to zero because you know we use technology, we're going to have to figure out who is responsible, who is accountable, who could afford it. So this is our major challenge. Technology can work hand in hand with us, or technology can work against us. Finding the right balance will be absolutely crucial to humanity and to democracy, because if we don't find the right balance, we may end up in a place where democracy is shrunk, where it's automated, you know, where machines decide our fate. That would indeed be like Blade Runner. So four points how to make that happen, uh, to create your own future, going back to the beginning, observe. So this is the number one skill, is as long as you know what's going on and you can see the future, you will find a way forward to figure out what to do. Observation is the key thing. This is not prediction, this is not about magic sauce, you know, this is just looking. Understand. I always like to say you can talk to your kids, but understanding your kids is a whole different cup of tea. So understanding this is really a human skill, imagination. Einstein famously said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And that is interesting from Einstein, of course, because he had genius knowledge. Right? I guess that is a consequence of having that knowledge. But I would say there's nothing wrong with knowledge, but imagination is the skill of the future. Good exercise to do is to say, okay, what am I going to be in five years? What's my company going to be in five years? What is possible in five years? I think that's a very good exercise. And then to develop what I call foresights. I've talked about that before. Most importantly, in my book, I, I use a phrase that I would like to reiterate. We, we shouldn't think of the world as a giant algorithm. Right? The world isn't a machine. We aren't machines. You could argue that eventually, you know, we may be able to be explained by machines, but this is a different discussion. Right? So. We need to embrace technology because there's no other way than to do that. Right? We're, we're not going to go back and put technology back in the back. Right? Uh, that's not going to be plausible. Right? But we shouldn't become technology. We shouldn't allow the things that make us human to be removed because it's, it's going to be much more efficient right? uh, or easy or fast. So a very important point at the end here. So I want to thank you for your time, and uh, I know you're probably going to have lots of questions, so uh, I want to summarize by saying one important thing at the end. Uh, I think the future is better than we think in general. And that is because when we take all the positive things that we're seeing, all we need to do is to make the right decisions. And I mean, the power that we're going to have use technology will be absolutely mind-boggling. There's nothing bad about that. The good part is that we have to figure out how to uh, deploy it and how to regulate it. Thanks very much for listening. So, first question, free book. Oh, yeah, you go. Okay. <laughs> Hi. I'm curious, and, and if you've, uh, I've been reminded of two books that I've read, and I'm, I'm guessing that you have, and I'm curious on your opinion on them. Uh, one is The Fourth Turning, and the other is H.G. Wells' uh, The Time Machine. Yeah, I'm familiar with both. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, H.G. Wells obviously was ingenious in the way that he described the future, something that very few people can do. I think the, the skills of the past, however, they were a little bit easier to do because the future was not moving as quickly. I get this question all the time saying, oh, yeah, we talked about this 30 years ago, and when the Industrial Revolution came, we had less farmers, and you know, we had the same problem. But the magnitude of what the change that's happening today, eh? the magnitude is just infinitely larger. For example, uh, in the Industrial Revolution, our, our horses were replaced with cars and with railways, and you know, we had all these new tools, but we're still people. In this revolution, is going to go in us, right? is going to actually change us, you know, our genomes, our thinking, our intelligence, our cultural relationships, our age, our longevity. That is a whole different ballgame, right? So we, we cannot go and, and compare the two, right? So I like those two books, but time frame wise, of course, they're part of the earlier generation of discussion about the future. Yeah? The other thing I think is really important is, I think uh, William Gibson said this, the future is already here, is just unevenly distributed. Right? We need to realize that in many ways, you know, we're sitting in this room talking about genome editing or so, this at this very moment, things going on that are quite literally already astounding. Right? Both good and bad. Right? So that is something we really have to look at and be aware of to understand the future. Another question? You get the second book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not quite as uh, optimistic as you because uh, I'm worried, uh, especially right now, about the decisions that are being made and especially in social terms. If we have all of these people whose jobs are abolished, we have to rethink society and how people can make a living and have a living wage without being employed. So society has to be rethought completely and quickly. Yeah. You, is that a question or what is it? Yeah, <laughs> it is a question. <laughs> okay, uh, I knew you were going to ask that, so I have a slide for that. Um, so basically what is happening, and this is what gives me hope, right? Uh, we're basically nearing the end of the current economic system because of technology. Right? Technology makes it possible for everything to become abundant. You know, we have abundant music already, Spotify. We have abundant films, entertainment. Pretty soon we have abundant traffic, you know, cars, transport, Uber, and so on. We have abundant medical, which is the next generation of medical uh, services. Banking right, will become cheap and international free, more or less. So technology makes it possible to, uh, to have abundant things, but the bottom line really is that in roughly 20 years or so, we're going to this new paradigm that has been talked about forever. Uh, that's basically what I call a people, planet, profit. So it's basically the idea of saying we don't do things just because we want to further business or revenues, which would be rather dangerous. I agree with you on that, right? If you would say that we're doing these things because I think McKinsey said artificial intelligence and technology is roughly a $62 trillion business, a new business unfolding. Very tempting. I think if we end up doing that, then we end up in a place where all that counts is how many people we have fired. And that would obviously not work. So there's a big political challenge, societal challenge, to realize where we have to put the money back in. So Bill Gates was asking for an automation tax, for example. Nobody likes taxes, clearly. I mean, I have yet to meet a person that likes, except for Danish people, they like taxes. But, you know, in Switzerland, we are actually also paying taxes. You know, it's not that we don't pay taxes, but, but this is a difficult conversation. I mean, clearly, if AT&T or any other mobile company figures out how to automate the network maintenance, you know, telecom operations, it's 100,000 people gone. And they're working on that. That's a fact. Right? And if a trucking company can figure out how to create a, a, what's called a, 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 a truck train, right, where 50 trucks drive on I-80, one after the other, and there's only one guy that sits in the first truck, drives all the others, right? 
That's going to be a while, but that is safely can say that a lot of truckers will be out of work. Right? So at that point, we're going to have to figure out what to do with them, how to re-educate them, how to maybe give them a guaranteed income, which has been a big debate. And there's no commercial solution to this. Right? There's, you can't just say, well, it's too bad for them. The American way, just kidding. No, no. We, we can't do that, right? Uh, because what happens then, you know, if, if we do that, then uh, unemployment, unemployed youth is the most dangerous part of society, right? And terrorism, which is increased by inequality. So that, the challenge is to switch to that system. And you know, in Switzerland, we already have, because of our political system, uh, last year we had a vote on the guaranteed minimum income which sounds like socialism, but it's really, it's really an interesting angle because the proposal was to get $2,700 a month, that is considered poverty level in Switzerland, right? <laughs> to get that regardless of work or not. And it got 26% of votes voted for that. To get people to sort of have a minimum income without any requirement. That is clearly going to happen, not, not now. I mean, that, that would be a ludicrous proposal here with 300 million people. Right? But at the same time, you can see where this is going. It may become possible because of technology to do that. So long-winded answer really is, yes, we're going to have a lot of serious problems by people who have jobs that basically go out of style, you know, that technology can replace. And we can't ignore that. The U.S. will be hit quite hard, but not as hard as India and China. You know, 40 million people work in call centers. I mean, call center is 100% automation, right? Do you need compassion to be in a call center? Uh, sometimes, but, you know. I've, I've seen demos where I, 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 I called a call center, and I could not tell 9 out of 10 that it was a robot that I talked to. In fact, some people sound like robots when I call them now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so that, that is a huge social issue. I think the good thing is, however, first, technology will make life a lot cheaper. Not now, but in roughly 10, 15 years. Right? Less healthcare costs, less transportation costs, right? food, water, desalination, energy. Right? That is good news, but not here. <laughs> so, the, and the other thing is, we're going to have new jobs that are possible because of the changes that are happening. So we shouldn't be that negative except for the jobs that are clearly like bookkeeping or check out the supermarket. We have to capture that somehow. I'm afraid there's no current process for this. There's a question. Yeah, back there. You have one right here. Okay, so yes. What do you see for the future of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Okay. I'll, I'll explain briefly what that is. A cryptocurrency is an encrypted peer-to-peer -peer exchange of information that allows for financial transactions to flow anywhere worldwide without much supervision. It reduces the cost of transaction by 99%. It's sort of like Skype or like peer-to-peer -peer traffic most of and it's Bitcoin and what's called the blockchain, right? So the bottom line is money is going to go digital, right? That's point number one. So basically, uh, cash will probably be on its way out before too long, but essentially transactions become data transfers. And the blockchain is the key to make that work. I, I'm, uh, I'm not so optimistic as some people about the blockchain because I think central control of currencies is a cornerstone of government. I, I don't think governments will agree to decentralize that tool. We may decentralize contracts, you know, blockchain encrypted contracts and those. That's a huge opportunity. I don't think the financial system will be de uh, organized in that way anytime soon until we figure out how to control it. But it's definitely, I mean, if you want to read a book about this, Don Tapscott, my colleague, has a great book on, on the blockchain. Okay. I'm going to be here for, for later so we can also talk, you know, but let's take this question over there. And of course, all the answers are in my book, you know, all you have to do is read the book. <laughs> I'm afraid to say, actually, I have more questions in the book than answers, but 
Okay. Um, how would you, uh, how, how do you see um, like third world countries being incorporated in this? <clears throat> yeah, okay. Well, first what's happening is that the G7 are becoming the E7, right? The E7 are the, the seven most powerful emerging countries. Brazil, Indonesia, China, India, Russia. And the future is roughly in, in 25 years, they are going to hold the key to the future. The most people, the most money, the most growth. That's a fact. Right? So the E7 countries will be the countries that have the economic clout in the future. You can already see that happening with China. Uh, and that's going to change the whole geopolitical scenario. Uh, basically what it means for us, we're going to have to share our technology with them. Right? We're going to have to figure out a way to get them aboard of all the things that we have already accomplished right? and basically create a common economy. That's going to be quite a shift. I mean, the dollar will not be the lead currency in the future. It will be digital money. Eh? There'll be no such thing as a lead currency. It'll be digital. I'll take the one question in the end there because it's right next to Yeah, yeah. Right here. And then we're done. Hi, good evening. Um, first of all, um, I feel like having a fangirl moment here. Um, you resemble so much like Leonard Hofstadter from the Big Bang Theory. Like who? The Leonard Hofstadter, he's one of the correctors in the Big Bang Theory, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the show, so okay. I'm just having a gala of a time. Um, my question is, um, how do you foresee uh, emotional intelligence finding its spot in the age of artificial intelligence in future? Oh, yeah, that's a complicated question. I mean, basically what's happening today is that machine intelligence is very narrow. Right? So you can build a machine that beats the world champion in Go, which is a very difficult game, you know, Korean game, Chinese game Go. It was defeated last year. You can build a machine that can drive a car. You can do all of that, but totally simple things for humans that we do with our intelligence are impossible for machines today. That includes, for example, when you talk to a friend or a customer or reading between the lines, hearing what hasn't been said, I mean, the most important skill when you listen to your kids is to hear what they're not saying, right? Everybody knows that this is how we communicate. Machines don't do that. Uh, and that's just one example. So I think emotional intelligence is something that's inherently human. I think machines will learn to understand what we mean with that, but they will be far away from having that skill themselves, right? To be sentient, what's called sentient, right? Uh, that may eventually be achieved, but it's far away. So I think that really for what is happening for us, for our practical purposes, we have to focus on the things that are human only. Okay. The skills, the future, the jobs, the tasks. Anything that the machine can do, they will eventually learn how to do. Right? And emotional intelligence is one of those things that was completely the other way around. Ten years ago, if you would have said, we're looking to hire a person that has emotional intelligence, right? you'd get fired if you have emotions. right? basically. Right? Today is the reverse. You want people who are uh, lateral thinkers, critical thinkers, asking questions. There was a great ad from IKEA, you know, the Swedish company, the other day. IKEA is looking to hire lots of new people, right? And the ad says, we're looking for why sayers. Right? They're looking for people who say why and ask questions. Right? That, that was the ad. Right? I mean, think about that 10 years ago, you know, if somebody had said that you want to be a critical thinker, you know, you could go work in, at Whole Foods, you know, if you want, but you, you, you certainly wouldn't work in a company. So the skills of the future are exactly the opposite, and, and, and emotional intelligence is one of those things, right? So our EQ will in the future matter more than our IQ. Right? I think, obviously, if you, have, if you don't have much enough IQ, you'll still be in, in trouble. Right? So I always tell my friends and my kids, you know, if you can teach your kids about tech, that's good. They should understand science and technology and, and you know, the, the uh, uh, essentially the STEM sciences, right? But they have to be human. Right? They have to understand humans. That is the ultimate skill that machines will not take away from us. Thank you.
Briefly, thank you, Garrett. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to our online audience. Please fill out the surveys. Leave them with the volunteers on the way out. Uh, the discount applies to the book. And uh, if you have any feedback that you'd like to give us, uh, you can send that to humanitiesrochester at mayo.edu. So thank you one and all. It's been a great evening.